Good day, and thank you for joining the National Conference of State Legislatures and the Pew Charitable Trust for this webinar entitled Opportunity Zones State Strategies to Support Investments. My name is Emily Mayer, and I'm a policy associate in the Fiscal Affairs Program at the National Conference of State Legislatures. I will be serving as a moderator for today's webinar. As a reminder, if at any time during this webinar you have difficulty hearing the audio through your computer speakers, please use your telephone to dial in for the audio portion. Next slide, please. The National Conference partner with the Pew Charitable Trust to bring this webinar to you. In case you are not familiar with NCSL, we are a bipartisan organization that serves the legislators and legislative staffs of the nation's 50 states, its commonwealths and territories. Our mission is to strengthen state legislatures. Next slide, please. NCSL provides several different services, including research, testimony, and opportunities for lawmakers to exchange ideas on pressing state policy issues. This summer, we are hosting our annual Legislative Summit in Nashville. Keynote speakers include living legend Dolly Parton, presidential historian John Machem, and social entrepreneur Wes Moore. Next slide, please. Opportunity zones fall primarily within the jurisdiction of NCSL's Standing Committee on Labor and Economic Development. NCSL's Standing Committees provide a forum for legislators and legislative staff to exchange ideas and shape public policy. They meet twice a year at the NCSL Legislative Summit and at the NCSL Capital Forum, which will take place December 10th to the 13th in Phoenix, Arizona. For more information on these meetings or NCSL's activities and services, to legislators and legislative staff, please visit our website at www.ncsl.org. This jointly sponsored webinar will look at the new Opportunity Zone program, which are, for, which are a new federal tax credit designed to stimulate investment in distressed communities. While the program is administered by the federal government, states took the lead in nominating zones for designation and have a role to play in implementation. We'll hear from experts at the Pew Charitable Trust Stephanie Copeland, CEO of the Governance Project, and Mark Waski, Vice President and Counsel of the Indiana Economic Development Corporation. After we hear from our presenters, we will open the discussion to include questions from the audience. To ask questions, you can simply type a question in the Q&A box in the right-hand corner of your screen. We will take as many questions as possible within the time we have available. Now I will turn, I will turn the program over to John Heyman at the Pew Charitable Trust. Welcome, John. Thanks very much, Emily. Um, so like Emily said, my name's John Hemmen. I'm with the Pew Charitable Trust. So for those of you who don't know us, Pew's State Fiscal Health Project examines key trends in state finances and evaluates states on their performance. We conduct research and provide guidance to states to help them navigate their fiscal challenges and identify potential policy choices. So for both NCSL and state fiscal health, our primary audience is state policymakers. And because of that, the Opportunity Zone program presents a challenge to states because unless states are proactive, they won't have much involvement. There aren't really very many touch points built into the Opportunity Zone program. Um, one of Opportunity Zone's primary goals is helping all regions succeed, and this is a priority for every state. So we're wondering what um, states can do to use this program as an opportunity to leverage their own initiatives. Um, the Opportunity Zone investments are decisions that are going to be made at a local level, project by project, but that doesn't mean that states can't support their communities by ensuring that they have the tools to make the most of these investments. Uh, the reason I'm excited to hear from Stephanie and Mark is because both of them have great perspectives on this, so I'll go ahead and introduce both of them. So first up, Stephanie Copeland. She's the CEO of the Governance Project and partner at Four Points Funding. Stephanie joined the Governance Project and became a managing partner for, of Four Points Funding on January 1st of this year after serving on Governor John Higginlooper's cabinet as the executive director for the Colorado Office of Economic Development for two years. Um, while at the Office of Economic Development, Stephanie initiated and implemented several programs that include Startup Colorado, the formation of the Greater Colorado Venture Fund, the Opportunity Zone Program for the state, and the Governor's Council for the Advancement and Acceleration of Blockchain Technology. Before this appointment, Stephanie spent over 26 years in the telecommunication industry, both in the US and Europe. 
Her last role was as president of the Zio Group, a communications infrastructure services firm, and she served as director for the Colorado Broadband Deployment Board, the Business Experiential Learning Commission, the Governor's Blockchain Council, and the Colorado Workforce Development Council. A Blackstone entrepreneur, she also serves as an advisor to early stage companies in Colorado. And joining her is Mark Waske, who is the vice president of the Council of the Indiana Economic Development Corporation. Uh, there, Mark leads government and community relations for IEDC, developing and executing economic development strategies to facilitate new job creation, investment, and quality of place developments in Indiana. Since joining the IEDC, Mark has played an integral role in the implementation of a number of strategic programs spearheaded by the governor of Indiana, including the Indiana Regional Cities Initiative, a multi-billion dollar program supporting investments in quality of life projects to attract and retain talent in Indiana. Mark also worked with the Indiana General Assembly to secure funding and support new nonstop air service from the state's international and regional airports, which led to the successful launch of Indiana's first year-round nonstop transatlantic flight with service from Indianapolis to Charles de Gaulle Airport in Paris, France. Uh, prior to joining IEDC, Mark was a legislative assistant at the Indiana General Assembly, where he worked closely with legislators, staff, and external shareholders on a wide variety of legal and legislative issues related to economic development as well as labor and employment matters. Mark's also an attorney. Um, so before I hand it over to Stephanie, who will be giving an overview of the Opportunity Zone program, I just wanted to say we've reserved most of the time for questions from the audience. So as Emily said, please um, click the box on the right-hand side if you think of anything as you're listening to the presentation. You can enter in your questions. Um, and one last note, we'll be making the recording and um, slides available after the presentation. So with that, uh, go ahead, Stephanie, take us away. Thanks so much, John, and it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, the um, By now, many of you uh, may have heard about the Opportunity Zone Incentive, and interestingly enough, we, and I do this myself, we will call this a program, um, but it really isn't. It is an incentive for taxpayers and therefore, the programmatic support around it is really up to local entities, both state and local governments, to put in play. So with that, I'm going to um, just go through very, very quickly the benefit one more time so that people understand where the, where the dollars actually come from and what the, in, what the incentive was intended to be. Um, so next slide. So opportunity zones were part of the job uh, the Tax Cut and Jobs Act of 2017. It was a provision buried at the very end of the um, of this legislate, legislature and uh, legislation, and it was supported in a bipartisan way. It was very much supported by both sides of the aisle, and continues to be supported um, by both Democrats and Republicans on the Hill, which is fantastic because um, we believe this is going to take that kind of support to really have the impact that it that it needs. Um, it essentially incents um, capital that would otherwise flow to kind of the usual suspected areas where capital normally flows, where, where capital creates high returns. It incents that capital to look for investment opportunities in distressed areas. So in 2018, early 2018, each of the governors of the state had 90 days to designate zones in their states that were, that were eligible census tracts based on income and poverty rates um, to be designated as opportunity zones and to provide, um, again, an incentive in these areas for capital to come searching for opportunity to invest. If this is properly executed, it will actually carve new paths for capital deployment into areas that have not seen capital um, investment in some time. It can also do um, interesting things around development of workforce and creating jobs, funding new infrastructure in, in communities that um, have struggled for some time, and providing new, um, what is seemingly and thematically pervasive around the U.S., um, potentially new housing stock that could allow for more people to be less cost burdened and to have access to affordable housing. Next slide. So the taxpayer benefits, again, this is not a fund, this is not a government, um, this is not government money. This is, um, this is leveraging taxpayer capital gains. 
there are estimated um, around $6.1 trillion of unrealized capital gains sitting on individual balance sheets around the country. And that is in part due to the uh, kind of the long and protracted appreciation in the stock market as well as the real estate market. Um, but and we're, the, the, the legislation cleverly anticipated that these, as the macroeconomic cycle shifts, that these gains would be looking for a place to um, both be realized and to uh, be shifted to another investment. So what this, what this taxpayer uh, benefit does is if you have a capital gain that you'd like to realize, you want to sell stock or sell a business or sell real estate, you can sell that capital, you can sell that investment. And instead of paying taxes on that capital gain, you can defer your taxes until the end of 2026, December 31st, 2026, you can, if you hold the investment, um, but you can defer that by investing in an opportunity fund. If you hold that investment for five years, you get a 10% discount on the capital gain when you eventually sell it. If you hold it for seven years, you get a 15% discount on the capital gain when you eventually sell it. And if you hold an investment for 10 years, the investment that you make, if it creates appreciation, so if you invest a dollar and in 10 years it's worth $1.50, the 50 cents will not be taxed at all. You'll have a, a complete forgiveness on the appreciation. Next slide. So again, you roll your gains forward into an opportunity fund, you defer, reduce, and eliminate taxes. Again, all of this benefit accrues to the investor and the investor controls where the dollar is invested. Next slide. So a qualified opportunity fund is, is essentially a fund that's established by a partnership or corporation. It is a typical private equity or venture capital fund. Um, it must be a partnership. And the taxpayer has, from the time they sell their, their gains, they have 180 days to move that into an opportunity zone fund. And the fund has 180 days to deploy and to invest that into a qualified opportunity zone property or business. The 90% of that, 90% of the of the opportunity zone fund has to be deployed within this time frame, and it is checked six months after the fund takes in capital, and at the end of the taxable year. Um, we are there's there's a reasonable um, working capital safe harbor which allows for a fund to deploy um, dollars into a an account that allows for um, for it to be deployed against a working project. So, for example, when you're building housing or real estate, it's typically a two or three year time frame, and so you can invest it into a working capital account, which is going to be used for that development as long as there is a, a relevant plan behind that. Essentially, Treasury and um, the legislation is trying to make sure that this money is not just being deferred and sheltered, it is being put to work to investment, um, investment as intended. And the only real test um, that exists right now um, is a self-certification and a declaration of deployment, which is subject to audit um, by the IRS. Next slide. So local concerns about the incentive, and many people have heard about this. Investment, if if the zones are in areas that were already on a path to gentrification, investment can just accelerate displacement. Investment could enable predatory activity and actors and that um, people would take advantage of the incentive but not um, benefit the community that they're actually making the investment in. The investment can go to a project that would have happened anyway. And finally, national funds and local projects are very, very difficult to synchronize. So many of these investments will be small and capital flows tend to flow in big chunks. Next slide. So the next, the, the, the thing that we were most concerned about in Colorado when we designated um, the zones were that the conversation is really fueled by developers and investors and communities really, as John said, do not, re, are not required to play an active role in the conversation. So, Communities, um, while they may want to attract certain types of capital, they really are not in the driver's seat on, on how capital will flow or if it will flow into the community. Next slide. 
And, and, and the reason for this is many communities um, have limited technical capacity or constrained resources to really dedicate around attracting capital into a community. Many communities have either political or philosophical reluctance to drive any development given uh, a community's vision for itself. And communities are, are often um, have anxieties about completely being ignored but, ignored but don't know what to do or, or about displacement risk but don't know what to do. Next slide. So what we've seen across the country that's been working is bringing the right parties together, convening the uh, right local authorities, the right people with agency that want to see particular types of investment in the community to shape, to drive towards its vision, convening them around uh, visions for specific projects, specific goals. Engaging, um, what we've also seen is engaging local anchor institutions and foundations, very, very important. Universities, hospitals, big anchor institutions that can help drive um, investment in a way that benefits the local constituents of that community. And finally, City Hall is a, can be a very, very strong actor by either um, intervening with development and, and negotiating different community benefits with the development and or um, supporting catalytic projects that with, with different incentives that would otherwise not be catalytic or beneficial for the community. Next slide. So there are 102 documented funds so far, and that this is probably two months old, about $23 billion of funds raised now seeking opportunity zone investments. I see at least 100 a week, um, different projects hitting my desk looking for investors and looking for um, opportunities to move money into opportunity zones. I am not yet seeing many investments that look to be impactful in a positive way to communities. They are mostly real estate and mostly um, uh, market rate or commercial, market rate housing or class A, class B commercial space. Next slide. That's the majority, that's not, there are exceptions to that. Um, what investors are doing, they are putting together small single asset funds where they're, they're raising a fund around a project institutional investors and large foundations still moving slowly and cautiously trying to figure out what to do. Um, and there are topologies that are being formed to rate the credit worthiness and the investment worthiness of places. And that's because many of these places do not have strong track records of investment. There are emerging series of platforms um, that are trying to facilitate transparency and in investment. And there are Definitely um, community development projects going on, but they are mostly still watching what's happening and not really driving. Next slide. Foundations are also playing a role here. Next slide. Um, Kresge and Rockefeller both sent out a request letter of, of interest for fund managers. They had 151 fund managers come back to them and say they would like to establish an opportunity fund and Kresge actually funded two fund managers that are deploying large amounts of capital um, in impact areas. Kresge essentially put rules around that the fund managers that they would have to report on and they needed to be mission aligned around um, the kind of impact these funds, these investments would have. Would have. There are also many foundations are providing administrative support, training, some loan guarantees, some investment guarantees, and potential loss coverage on investments in order to attract this private capital. Remember that this is capital that will not naturally flow, it has to create a return for the investor and therefore will attract a certain type of investor. And finally, um, uh, local foundations have supported a lot of convenings, um, but we are starting to see local foundations also come in and support particular uh, developments that, again, would not otherwise attract capital, but are good for the community. Next slide. So market making, we are in the, in the process of, of market making. And so lots of, um, lots of cities and foundations are trying to figure out how do we de-risk, how do we continue to de-risk investment in our areas 
such that we can start a cycle of investment that is, again, both beneficial to the investor and also beneficial to the um, community. So right now, um, there are things going on with risk mitigation. Again, the, the opportunity zones have a high degree of risk that the incentive does not always correct for. Many of the communities are trying to build capacity, um, but they lack the capacity to support a de dedicated opportunity zone coordinator, which we think is key. Um, some, some projects that we've seen are very highly beneficial to communities, but do not have the right um, revenue structure. They're not enough revenue support to really attract capital and therefore need support of local municipalities and foundations to subsidize these investments. And um, measurement and transparency support, uh, we are, again, there are no current rules for, um, for measurement or for providing any details of an investment, although Treasury has indicated that there may be requirements coming on the form that funds file to self-certify. So we're looking in across the country, different states are looking at how to, how to um, drive tracking mechanisms that will allow us to see what's actually happening and whether um, impacts are, um, investments are having the right kinds of impacts on communities. Next slide. So the key to all of this is to be very, to be hyper-local. If you're really trying to drive community benefit, you really have to be kind of down at the very, very local community. So next slide. So if, because if, if opportunity zones are facilitated well, you could actually see investment coming in that allows um, more affordable housing to be available to uh, distressed neighborhoods, more businesses being formed in these neighborhoods that can create jobs, and more of an ecosystem of prosperity that also includes the, the residents of these communities and not just displacement. Next slide. So the main thing that I, we think the Opportunity Zones can do, which would be very, you know, which would endure beyond the incentive, is bring the public and private sector closer together in order for joint benefit to occur, where both investors can make money while communities are able to um, support some of the strongest problems that exist in their community, um, specifically targeted to uh, improving economic mobility. Next slide. In Birmingham, we were, we've been working there with the mayor, um, bringing together a coalition of um, philanthropists, corporations, university, and city government, um, as well as PNC Bank, to put together both a fund and targeted projects that bring jobs, a, um, additional housing, as well as um, commercial space for these new businesses. Um, to locate in the Civil Rights District. This is one example of a project that we've been working on in an area, and it's taken a tremendous amount of inter intervention and convening to ensure that both the capital that was necessary to make this work was attracted to the, to the project, and also that the benefit to the community was really well spelled out and was um, insured. There, we are looking at about 140 units of workforce housing and five set-aside units for nonprofits um, that are helping formerly incarcerated individuals. And this kind of project would not have happened unless a number of groups had come together working on aligned interests. Next, next uh, slide. So takeaways, substantive capacity support is required and bringing people together. Business investment, investment in operating businesses is, is slow moving and it's, it's a longer story, but uh, mostly because the incentive is so place-based that many businesses that require equity are not so concentrated in one place. And cities that are best prepared to advance projects um, have already really developed a vision for themselves. And those that had not done that are quickly, quickly developing vision so that they can very, very specifically focus on projects and, um, and consortia that can help to develop these. Next slide. So thank you for, uh, for the time today, and I will turn it back over to John. Great. Thanks very much, Stephanie. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started with some questions. Um, Mark, are you on the line?
Okay, we'll make sure that uh, he gets put in on the call. In the meantime, uh, the first question I wanted to ask, and Stephanie, you can tackle this one. Uh, what is it do you think legislators need to know? What kind of questions do you think they should be asking? I think um, at the state level, legislators in their own district, A, need to understand where the opportunity zones are in their district, but also whether there are any, um, if, if their districts are gonna take advantage of the capital that may be seeking investment opportunities, the, their districts need to have either a plan or a task force that is looking at how to attract capital. And there need to be, at the state level, putting resources behind that for each district or each um, region that is, um, that is looking to very much attract capital, we think is really important. In different states, we've seen um, the state legislature as well as the governor's office Put, make resources available for specific cities or regions that are interested in driving, um, driving the uh, discussion and attracting capital and not just reacting to, cap, uh, to capital that's potentially looking um, at their area. So we think that it's important that legislators understand what's already going on in the district, which they all do, but I mean around opportunity zones, and understand whether or not there could be a coalition or a task force assigned that um, that could help drive it in that particular region back to the point of being hyper-local. Great, um, that, that kind of reminds me of a point you made earlier. You thought that maybe an option for communities uh, could be like a dedicated coordinator. That's like a, an option for either the state to help facilitate or for communities to, to do themselves. Do you think that's a, a good option? I think it's it's one of the most it's, it's one of the most quick and easy options and one of the most powerful. As soon as you have someone really coordinating this as a full time role or at least as a substantive part of their role, you see things move more quickly and um, it, and actually move mo more towards looking at investments that are going to benefit the community having an equal voice. We think that's a very very powerful thing that state and local legislators can uh, can help facilitate. Great. I, I think we got Mark on the line. Are you there? All right. We'll give it one more try. It's the Stephanie show for now. Um, can you <laughs> Come on, can Mark. talk about <laughs> uh, yeah, how opportunity zones are different from regular incentives? You kind of mentioned at the start, it's, it's, yeah it's easy to, for us to think about these things as like a program, but that's not exactly what it is. So how, like, how should policymakers be thinking about this differently? Yeah, it, it's, the think about opportunity zones come with no public funding at all. This is essentially a tax incentive that says to investors, hey, if you're looking to um, invest in areas, look here because you'll see a tax shelter and a tax benefit for this. It does not, Subsidize investment. It does not accelerate um, any or make investments any easier or um, smoother. It is nothing. It does nothing around um, around shaping um, investment hypothesis other than provide a reason for people to be looking in areas that they otherwise wouldn't be. Most investors will continue to invest the way they they will continue to look at their investment thesis in the same way they always have, which means if we're going, they're going to invest somewhere, they're going to look for intrinsic value and return. And the opportunities on incentive may be a risk mitigator, but they will not look at that as something that will make a bad investment good. So there, that's why so many local stakeholders need to come together to support and, um, and attract that capital and de-risk it such that um, such that investors will be interested in, in putting money to work in these places. Um, and, and again, that can be something that local community stakeholders, including the mayor's office, including foundations, are not used to playing that role of actively being the, in the driver's seat here. That's great. Uh, we'll take a few from the audience now. So uh, one of the first ones we got was, uh, how can we find out what investments are being made in the state? Where, what types of where, what types of projects are these going to? You mentioned earlier there's um, not a whole lot of reporting on this. Is there something that can be done or to help mitigate that? At this point, there's um, unfortunately there's no central repository of what is happening, 
And so it really comes down to research around what's going on. We have been tracking um, many investments that are that have been made, um, a handful in Detroit, in Houston, in the Bay Area, one in Las Vegas that I just recently saw, but there's no central repository for it. Some states have set up websites where they're trying to track what they're seeing as well. We believe that um, that the Treasury will come out with rules that when um, when the funds self-certify, they will have to report on certain intent and certain investments they're making, which will help to understand that. Um, but at this point, there's no central repository for it. The best thing I think state legislators can do is to coordinate with the governor's office and the economic development team to understand what, if anything, they're doing to try and track this. Here in Colorado, we have a website and the state OZ director um, also has touch points in every market to keep herself in the loop on any developments that are that are happening. It is manual work right now. Yeah, and that's. Um, I wish I had a better answer. Yeah. yeah, no, that's a great answer because one of the things that I was going to ask Mark, I know you in Colorado and also in Indiana, they've put up a transparency or an investment database kind of portal for projects to be able to to be able to feed in. Um, so any chance that Mark, you're, we can we can hear you this time. Can you hear me now? Ah, yes, we can. Perfect. Perfect. I apologize for for not having the appropriate connection, but I guess to, to dive right in and answer your your question most directly, um, you know, it similarly relates to a lot of what Stephanie had talked about about you know making sure that the local communities are engaged in the process. Um, and then building relationships between the local communities who are aware of uh, projects that are um, you know, being implemented within their jurisdictions and having communication between those communities and the state. Um, you know, that is, you know, you know, a product of building those relationships and trust in the absence of some explicit reporting requirement, um, either at the state level or at the federal level. Um, and that's what we've been trying to do in Indiana is, um, you know, pull all of the different um, public philanthropic community stakeholders together um, to have some type of a portal where, you know, the, the impetus for it was trying to connect projects with potential investors. Um, but we're seeing it as a way for us to get an inventory of potential opportunities and then continue to track those through the development process. Um, we've also had conversations with um, you know, folks with, within our Secretary of State's office through um, the online portal that every business in Indiana has to register through uh, to have you know, some election that might be able to be made on, on a business registration form to say that I am an opportunity fund. Uh, so at least we are also able to know what funds exist um, in Indiana. But you know, you know, all of this is an ongoing process. And I know that there, there is uh, legislation that's been filed by uh, Senator uh, Scott, Senator Booker, as well as uh, being sponsored by Senator Young from Indiana, that does create some additional reporting and compliance uh, requirements around the program to to hopefully facilitate you know you know that data collection to make sure that the program really is having positive impacts on communities throughout the country. That's a perfect answer. Um, Kind of building off of that, the transparency and data piece, one of the things we haven't actually even talked about is the analysis law. Is there anything that states or cities can do to, to kind of um, adjust for that? Oh, that? That can go to either Stephanie or Mark. Mark, go ahead. Yeah, so, so I, I guess it actually, you know, relates to a lot of what Stephanie's presentation was and, and some of the key points that she made in that um, you know, this is an incentive, not necessarily a program. So states and local communities do have, um, I guess, some leeway, for the lack of a better term, to, to put some structure around how they would like to see the um, incentive be used within their communities. Um, and it's really, you know, going to require a lot of proactive work on behalf of states in cities and towns uh, to determine really what their policy priorities are. Uh, to understand what the, you know, particular assets in their community, what they have, you know, the challenges that they face, and really how this incentive could then be utilized uh, to be able to specifically address those. 
Um, and I, I guess there, there's a couple of different ways that you could do that. One is through the creation of other incentive tools that are specifically targeted at supporting the type of investment that that community needs. Um, they can also, you know, at the local level, uh, look at opportunities to provide, you know, other maybe indirect non-traditional incentive to investors that are, you know, looking to invest in the particular projects, again, that, that they would like to see that are inclusive and, and that help, um, and that help bring about, you know, additional opportunities for economic prosperity for um, the individuals that are currently residing directly within the opportunity zone, but for the surrounding community as a whole. Um, you know, as far as, you know, specific measures and, and the way that, um, you know, the program will be evaluated for effectiveness, you know, there's two ways to look at it. One is the community impact side, and the other is, are we seeing increased investment activity within these particular distressed communities and and those don't necessarily align um, so finding a way to, to craft a policy that promotes investment uh, while at the same time you know promoting the particular um, investments that, that those individual communities need uh, to meet their unique needs um, you know is something that you know states and, and cities have the opportunity to do. Um, because there really isn't any, you know, performance measures in place within the law today. Anything to add, Stephanie, before we move on? No, totally agree. Yeah, he, Mark covered it. Perfect. Uh, I'm, I'm, Mark, I'm glad you mentioned kind of companion incentives because that was one of the questions we got from the audience. Have you seen any any types of programs that are currently um, being planned to go as like a component or a companion piece for in for opportunity zone incentives that states or locals are considering? Yeah. So I guess at the federal level, um, you know, the White House and this administration has made it uh, clear that they want to see this program, um, you know, have as much success as possible. So there are a number of federal programs through HUD, the EDA, um, and another in other federal agencies where they provide either a set aside or priority scoring for projects that um, submit applications for um, grant or loan funding. Um, other states have also explored different opportunities to either modify or create new state level incentives, whether those be tax credits or grant programs. Actually in Indiana during um, the last legislative session, um, the governor had proposed a new redevelopment tax credit to replace some of the existing programs that the IADC has today, providing us with a little bit more flexibility in the types of projects that we're able to provide an incentive for. Um, and during that, you know, the legislative process, um, a couple of stakeholders raised an important point in, in that, you know, some of these redevelopment projects in opportunity zones and other um, dis disadvantaged communities um, have some increased risk associated with them. Uh, so we actually are now able to provide under this new program an additional tax credit incentive to projects that are located within opportunity zones or are eligible for new market tax credits. So it, it's in the same areas that could have been designated, but um, ultimately weren't selected by the governors of you know the 50 states. So yeah, I guess that's a, a long-winded and indirect way of saying that there are states that have pursued this Indiana has um, by providing, I guess, a you know a kicker of sorts uh, for the IEDC to be able to provide additional incentives to these types of projects. That's perfect. Yeah, at the um in, in Cal, you know, states of California has done some things. You know, they've essentially there are a few states that um, don't conform with federal tax code with regard to capital gains. California being one, and because the marginal tax rate there is, is so high, it's a meaningful difference for investors. And they have uh, they they currently are working on legislation that would conform only for certain projects. Um, that's one way a state has kind of intervened with uh, with the tax incentive. In New Jersey, they are looking at um, supporting funding for um, for up to five communities in New Jersey to drive uh, to set up opportunity zone coordinators and to drive um, to drive the uh, discussions and attract the capital. In other states, I think there was another state, and I do not remember where, Mark, you may know this, that actually set up a stop loss um, function whereby there are up to a certain amount um, 
investments that are made in particular opportunity zones would have some sort of stop loss um, security that helps to down you know, to downside risk protect some of the investments. But um, states are still they, they are doing things very very much um, appropriate for their state, but many have um, have yet to really focus on this as a programmatic way to attract capital. And Stephanie, I, I don't know the specific state that did that, but I, and if it comes to me uh, during this conversation, I'll make sure to chime in. But um, one other thing that we've explored in Indiana and, you know, is, you know, gets to the root of both the programmatic component of how a state could implement this, but also one that local communities that may not necessarily either think that they have the ability to attract investment or um, you know have worthwhile projects that may not just get on the radar um, of national investors or you know even regional investors is providing some assistance to communities that don't have the capacity to to put together a program that's tailored to that city or town's unique needs. Um, that could be another way that states could help um, you know direct investment in a way that benefits both the investors and the community. Uh, by making sure that the, the community actually has the resources available, whether it be people um, or funding to put together some sort of plan that outlines their vision and the types of projects that they'd like to see. Um, that, that could be another opportunity for states to, to support the implementation of the incentive in their, in their state. Yeah, actually, that was one of the things I wanted to follow up with Stephanie on. I'd seen that Colorado would maybe is, is looking at this and in, in setting up kind of prospectuses, example of prospectuses for communities and maybe providing technical assistance on how to, to write them. Could you maybe talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, when we, uh, before I left, when Governor Hickenlooper transitioned out, we essentially set up um, a central fund that any community could apply for, and we made it a very, the application is just calling the calling the agency and asking based upon particular merits of what the community is looking for to help them build a prospectus, hire, um, hire a coordinator to build a prospectus, um, uh, advocate for particular projects, or actually conceive certain investments that uh, the community would like to see. So we set up this central fund that we made available for all the communities across the state with a um, with an emphasis on helping the smaller communities that have less resources. So that was one thing we did that we thought would be super, you know, super quick to get in place so that um, states that had, or communities that had very few resources could access funding to hire. And there are probably seven communities that have uh, built prospectuses using that funding. We also, the governance project, we're, we're getting ready to do this in Vermont as well, We've also hosted a workshop for um, small communities in Colorado, whereby we walk through kind of step by step what you can do, and also what we walk through kind of the investor vantage point, so that uh, communities better understand what investors are looking for. We it's a two part workshop. We did the first part um, about a month and a half ago. We're doing the next part in June. We're doing the same thing in Vermont, and we're hoping to just roll that out to states that want to use this workshop series to help reach their um, to reach their small communities. And we do this, again, as part of our nonprofit. It's, we don't, we, this is no, there's no charge for it. We just go out and help the states um, uh, bring in, either by webinar or in person, many of their smaller communities to help them uh, figure this out. That's actually a, a great segue into another question we've gotten from the audience, um, which was kind of about investment in opportunity zones so far, you'd mentioned earlier that maybe some of the larger actors were a little slower to move. And so as part of your assistance, like, is it helpful for states to kind of differentiate between the smaller project-based funds versus the bigger ones? Should they be like worrying about attracting certain kinds or is there like a, a, a best way for them to approach these sorts of things? From my perspective, I think it's really important for states to understand the landscape of investors, because if you're, you know, if you have an if you have an investment and you're working as a local stakeholder to try to promote that investment, and you're not connected to the right type of investor, it will become very very frustrating. So you need to understand 
um, A, what kind of, what size of equity investment these investors are looking to place? B, what asset classes are they most interested in? C, what geographies and what, ge what geographies and what um, they are interested in, which, which ones are they not interested in? What kind of, um, I think that understanding that will better help states um, and local communities once they have something that's investable to connect with the right kind of investors, which is a big part of the equation as well. Great. Uh, another one we got from the audience. Uh, Mark, maybe you could answer this one. I think uh, one program that a lot of people in states are familiar with is the existing enterprise zone. I was wondering if you could kind of differentiate between the opportunity zones and the enterprise zones. They're, they don't exactly overlap, but could you maybe like shed a little light on what enterprise zones are and if there's any continuity between the two or just that people should know there's, they're distinct? Yeah, I, I guess the, the first would be is, you know, they are similar in the fact that they are both place-based economic development I guess one's a program and the other is an incentive. Um, you know, in Indiana, our enterprise zone allowed communities with, um, you know, areas of town with that meet certain income, poverty, and unemployment levels to be designated by what, what used to be the Department of Commerce, but was transitioned into the IEDC um, to have us designate those areas as opportunity zones, or excuse me, as enterprise zones. Um, and that designation then opened up the door um, and the availability of, of a host of different incentive tools, both of, at the state and the local level. Um, and, and I think, you know, that program in, in, in Indiana was, was successful in some communities, but was also, um, you know, challenged at times in that it provided an, an incentive for a business to, you know, potentially just relocate from one place within the community to the other in order to be able to realize the benefit of a property tax deduction or a state tax credit. Um, so, you know, questions had been raised about the, the successful utilization and implementation of the Enterprise Zone program, um, and ultimately has led to us transitioning away from specific place-based incentives, you know, at least as what the IEDC has been focusing on and providing flexibility for us to be able to provide an incentive for any project, no matter where it's located, so we're able to ensure that the state is really going to be getting value out of, out of that program. Um, I, I guess the, the difference between the Enterprise Zone program and the Opportunity Zone incentive would be, one, you know, the state did have some control over the incentives at their disposal. And that's what I would, I guess, make a distinguishment between this program and the Opportunity Zone incentive is that, you know, there isn't that control. It's controlled by the investors. And the incentives that are ultimately provided, um, you know, come through the form of a, you know, kind of a grant from, you know, the traditional incentive form. Um, with an opportunity zone investment, that, that is an equity investment into a business or a piece of property. And they're expecting it, the investors expecting a return on that. So I guess that that would be the other distinguishment between the two is, you know, rather than flowing into a development in the form of a grant at the end of the day, um, you know, this is an equity investment with an investor expecting a return and, um, you know, that, that changes the nature of its impact on the project. That's a great point. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned the um, kind of avoiding past mistakes. I was wondering if you could maybe expand a, a bit about that, Mark, and then maybe you could follow up Stephanie like what so what are what can policymakers do to make sure that the opportunity zones are are more successful than the the previous place based programs we've seen before yeah I, I guess the the first thing that I would say is you know with the tools that the um, community or the state has at their disposal and the way that they decide to deploy them if there is flexibility there um, you know they can try and focus on the projects that um, truly do appear to be, you know, net new, um, you know, economic activity to the state. Um, that's one thing, one reason why we've tried to to rework um, the different programs that the I, that the IEDC controls um, was because we started to see, you know, an entitlement to that program um, or to that incentive, and in a way that didn't necessarily, you know, have the benefit that that was worth the state's investment. 
Uh, so that's one way in, in, from a policy point of view um, to try and direct state and local resources to projects, whether they be you know, using the opportunity zone incentive or not, uh, to those that do appear to meet, I guess, the, the but for test um, that we you know, generally try and apply to every project um, that we make an investment in. Um, the other is, you know, really trying to focus on, um, you know, supporting projects, again, that meet the specific needs of the community rather than um, just any, any project that is proposed by a developer or investor or business. Yeah, I would, I would just add, um, the thing that I think state legislature is really creating focus and dedicated support for this incentive and you're and creating a role for local government and or for state government to play that they haven't played in the past, which is actively driving investment versus facilitating investment, I think is very, very important. Either putting dollars in place or dedicating an office or a, a people to coordinate um, the attractiveness of this incentive, I think is really, really important for each state. And, and, and we'll work in any state where you do that. Um, there are other things that, depending upon the state's um, tax policy and different incentives that exist, there are strong ways to pair incentives such that um, you can pair an enterprise zone incentive with an opportunity zone investment and subsidize and de-risk the investment for investors, but that has to be orchestrated. And, um, and having somebody that's focused um, specifically on that will, I think, is, is very, very helpful for any state in any local community. We, the work that we do across the U.S. only works if we've got the right leader to work with in the community, and that happens more often when that leader has both agency from the state or the local community and support from fund, for funding of that position from the state or local community. Okay, I think um, we'll have our last question here, and it's actually something I've been thinking about myself. And um, it's maybe do either of you or, or Emily, do you know if, if anyone is tracking which states have passed legislation, legislation specifically to support opportunity zones? I know Maryland has, has done so, and if, I didn't know if you guys knew of any other states or if anyone else was keeping a list of them. Yeah, John, we actually, we have a, a list here internally, and I'm going to follow up with one of my um, colleagues who has access to that list, and we can send that over. I have, um, we have, a, we, again, these are just, uh, these are from the latter part of April. Arkansas passed uh, OZ conformity, so they were looking at conforming. Texas passed a tax credit um, and tax refund. A bill was introduced there um, as a franchise tax credit. Um, against opportunity zones. Ohio introduced some um, legislation around a 1% tax credit for investments in qualified opportunity zones. California, um, was they introduced in February an, an office support to support the geographic targeted economic development incentives, including OZ. Um, New York passed some tax benefits um, uh, around um, deferrals and the essentially just to conform with the federal law. So there are a number of things that we've been keeping track of, um, uh, but again, and happy to get that over to um, NCFL as well as the Pew, um, uh, as well as Pew, if you guys are, if that would be helpful um, to, uh, to, to know what's been going on across the state. Nope, that would be excellent. Um, yeah. So yeah, unless Mark or Stephanie, you have any closing thoughts, I'll just, send it over to Emily to close out. One thing I, I'd just like to say is that we do, this, this may feel like something that's so complex and so out of the wheelhouse of elected officials or public stakeholders, but it does have, I, I want you to just pause and know, it does have the potential to really carve new investment paths into geographies that have been either left behind or completely displaced its constituents and we do I just believe that other um, out there is this there's this virtuous um, phenomena that could exist between aligning aligning investor interest and community benefit that this incentive could help catalyze so I'd encourage you to 
do some research, pay attention to it, and really drive for more support and coordination in your um, in your districts. Anything from you, Mark? No, I, I think that it, we had a great conversation today. Hope, hope it was informative for everyone. Um, and you know, I appreciate you and in, obviously inviting me. And um, I, I'm really excited about the the potential that this incentive could have on you know doing as as Stephanie said is driving investment into some communities that haven't haven't realized the benefits um, that that some other communities have. And um, you know, we've seen the the value um, of of making these investments and and the value of local communities partnering closely with with their state agency partners in developing a cohesive vision and, and a plan for development. Um, you know, it, it's led to obvious you know, benefits through the Regional Cities Initiative, but um, really it started to attract attention from around, around the country for other projects that um, the state isn't necessarily involved in. Um, and I think that that's you know, a key component to the successful implementation of any program for this incentive. Um, in Indiana, you know, Ohio, and any in any state around the country um, is to have a plan that um, helps guide investors uh, to, you know, make changes within the communities that that, that meet that individual uh, town or city's unique needs. That's a great closing thought. Uh, so thanks, thanks very much to the both of you. So uh, Emily, thanks over for having you. Me. Yeah, sure thing. Thanks, uh, John. So this brings us to the conclusion of our webinar. If you have any questions following this event, um, please feel free to contact us at the email address shown on your screen. And this webinar, as John mentioned before, will be it has been recorded and will be archived on the NCSL website in the coming days. Um, thank you very much to our partners at Pew, our speakers, Stephanie and Mark, and a huge thanks to our audience for your interest and participation today. And have a great day. Everyone.